Hey there, great to have you watching again this Sunday morning. Really um, hope you've had an okay week with everything that's going on. I miss seeing you and miss um, connecting, but it's good to talk by phone and good to be in Facebook groups and things and YouTube for Sundays. So um, yeah, really blessings to you this Sunday morning. This morning we're going to continue with our Reading Romans Backwards series that we've been doing. Next week on Easter Sunday we'll do a special Easter Sunday message and then we'll go back to Romans 8 and we're going to finish our series with a bang, a positive bang in Romans 8, spend some time there looking at life in the Spirit. Quick recap. Now, some of you who've been with us all the way through will be experts at this, so I've tried to make it a bit briefer today. The main reason Paul is writing his letter to the Roman churches is to address a tension that has arisen between two groups in those churches, the weak and the strong. The attention has risen over Torah or law observance, particularly over food laws, over circumcision and over the Sabbath, observing these things. What Paul wanted was for the weak and the strong to put aside their differences and their different views and their privilege and their power and their contempt for each other and their judgmentalism and find peace, live in peace together as Jesus' people. And he outlines how he wants them to live in Romans chapter 12 through 15. And we've looked at that because we're going backwards through Romans. And we can summarise Paul's goal for these people and therefore the goal for us as well in this word that we've introduced called Christoformity. Paul wanted the people in these churches, the weak and the strong, to be conformed to the image of Christ in how they live, in their attitudes and their behaviour and their life together and their life in the society in which they lived in. He wanted them to become like Jesus in all that they did, to think and live and love like Jesus in their lives. Which sounds great, but there's a question that remains, how are they meant to do that? How are they meant to live this Christoform life? And that's what Romans 1 to 8, chapters 1 through 8, are about. How it's possible to live that way that Paul outlines later in the letter. And the answer to that and the summary of Romans chapter 1, verse uh, chapter 1 to 8 is this. Paul says the life they were to live together in Christ, this Christoform life, was not going to come through Torah or law observance, but through faith in Jesus and life in the Spirit. That's the secret to living this life, faith in Jesus and life in the Spirit. And last week we looked at faith in Jesus and what that meant, that sense of trust and loyalty that we come to God through faith in Jesus and we live by faith in Jesus. Today we're going to be exploring this idea of faith in Jesus and life in the Spirit by looking at chapters 5 through 7, so three chapters today, over an overview of it. And the main point for us today is really simple, and that's this. In Christ, we are blessed. In Christ, we are a blessed people. So I'll stick that there for you. What do we mean by that? Because we use that word a lot. In Christ, we are blessed. In Christ, we've been given some invaluable gifts. We have some things of great value in our possession. We're truly privileged and blessed people. In Christ, we can live a good and meaningful life. We could say in Christ, we're really rich. I don't know if you saw that, but that was my monopoly money. In Christ, we're wealthy. We have a lot of money. Not money, but we have a lot of gifts and rich. We're wealthy in Christ. We're rich. I just want to read to you um, from Romans chapter 5. We're going to go through just really quickly and going to find 10 ways in which we're rich in Christ, which we're blessed in Christ because we are in Christ together. So 10, going to keep track of them. You can do it like this or however you want to do it. But Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the first one. Number one, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. As people who are in Christ, we are at peace with God. We've made our peace with God, and it's through what Jesus has done, through our faith in what Jesus has done and who he is, that we have peace with God. We're rich. Secondly, we have access to God's grace. In verse 2 of chapter 5, it says, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. In Christ, we have access into God's grace. Number two, to God's unmerited favour and kindness towards us. And goodness, we stand in his grace. That's a beautiful concept to think that we stand in God's grace. And number three, in the same verse two, it says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. As followers of Jesus, we're people who have hope. We have peace, we have grace, and we have hope. We're people of hope. 
we have certain assuredness and confidence in who God is and God's love for us and God's hand over our lives. And the future is in God's hands. We're people of hope and that marks us. And Paul goes on in those verses to say that it sustains us and strengthens us and produces even more hope in us as we go through difficult periods, perhaps like we're going through now. It's an invaluable thing to live with hope and it's an awful thing to live without hope. In verse 5 of chapter 5, Paul says, not only that, he says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So we have the love of God in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's the fourth thing, fourth way that we are blessed. We have the love of God in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's a beautiful idea. It's a love that is in response to God's love. It's a love that God has demonstrated to us. Romans 5 verse 8 says, God has demonstrated his love to us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still far from God, while we weren't interested in God, he sent Jesus to die. Christ died for us, which we'll remember on Good Friday particularly. But God's love is such love that he would give his own son, his life of his own son, while we weren't interested in him. God's demonstrated his love, proved his love for us. And now God's love is in our hearts when we're in Christ. You know, that's a beautiful thought to think that the love of God is actually in our hearts. One of the marks of a Christian is that the love of God is in their heart. It's in there. It fills our heart, that sort of thing. And fifthly, in that verse, it says, we have been given the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us, it says. We're blessed to have the Holy Spirit. We actually have God's Spirit within us as a presence and giving us power. He's been given to us. You know, it struck me, even when we're alone, and some of you are actually having to live alone uh, in isolation or you can't leave your house and you're in your house, there's no one else in your house. And so you might feel that sense of loneliness. But as Christians in Christ, even when we're alone, we're never alone. Even when we're alone, we're never alone. God is with us through his spirit. We have that thing and that's a blessing. We're rich because of that. And then towards the end of... Um, well, the next few verses, chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, Paul speaks about the salvation that they have in Christ through faith. And he speaks in rich terms about this salvation, about the richness they have with that. And he says it encompasses um, a secure and confident standing before God, a reconciled relationship to God. It encompasses a relationship of bonded brothers and sisters with the other people in the church uh, in our own church and in the wider church. It encompasses the capacity to live a meaningful and good life through the Spirit and a path of transformation to become Christoform. And it encompasses the promises of the promise of resurrected life forever. All these things are encompassed in this idea of salvation and we have that. That is number six, actually. We have salvation. We have peace and grace and hope and all that love and the Holy Spirit and salvation. There's six things, even in those first few verses, that we have, that we are blessed. And we are rich. We're truly rich in Christ. After that, in Romans 5, from to verse 12, onwards to the end of chapter 5, Paul begins to talk about and contrast two great paths, two ways, two realms even you could think of, that it's possible to live in, that everybody lives in one of these two ways or two realms. They're fundamental ways to live. And you can see these two realms or two paths or two ways, whatever you want to call them, two lines even, run through the rest of these chapters, Romans 5 verse 8. And there's a contrast uh, and there's comparison. Paul does this between this. And the first way or the first realm is one characterised by sin and law and death. And he calls it the way of Adam, who's the original sinner. And the story of Adam is a tragedy. And the second way or second path or second realm that we can live in is a way characterised by righteousness and grace and spirit and life. And it's the way of Christ. And it's the story of Christ is a redemption story, a beautiful story. So there's the two contrasting lines or ways or realms we can live in. And as followers of Jesus, we live in the realm or the line of Christ. That's where we live. We live in that realm. We live in the line of Christ. And so we're blessed by that. We've been grafted into the story of God's big redemptive story that Joe talked about a couple of weeks ago. And it's a story of grace, of unmerited favour and goodness and kindness and generosity. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but I'll see. That's my part of the Bible that I'm talking about. That's the second part of chapter 5. 
um, in Romans. And as I read through that, I don't know if you noticed, I circled a lot of things. I circled the word grace because it was there quite often. And then I circled these little two words or underlined the gift. And in those 10 verses, the last 10 verses of chapter 5, there's five times where Paul, Paul speaks about the grace of God, the grace that we have. And there's five times where he says the gift we're being given. So this whole idea, this whole way of Christ is characterized by grace and gift, the gift God has given us, this generosity, this unmerited thing. And Paul says that is the way of Jesus. And we live in that. We live in the grace of God, in the gift. And the point that Paul makes and the contrast he has between sin and death and grace and life is stark. Sin brings death. Grace brings life. And we live in grace. We could say grace trumps sin or we could say grace eats sin for breakfast because that is the idea that Paul was getting across. Grace wins. We live in that realm of grace because we're in Christ. So having waxed lyrical about grace, as Paul does and as I've just done, to the weak and the strong, Paul anticipates a couple of questions that he might get asked or that Phoebe might get asked as she read this. And that's what we find in chapter 6, these questions that Paul is addressing. Chapter 6, verse 1, Paul, Paul says, So you might think, if grace is so good, should we go on sinning so that we can be even more grace in the world? And Paul said, no, that's a stupid idea. You've got that all wrong. Why would you do that? There's a misunderstanding of grace because grace truly understood and experienced fosters in us a sense of gratitude and love towards the one who extends grace to us, not an abuse of it. And God's grace towards us can cause us to want to live, should cause us to want to live for him and give our lives to him and please him in a more deeper and fuller way. And in Christ... We can do that. Paul says this, and let's read Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. He says, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And I love that. I've double underlined that in my Bible because the idea that the reason that we that Christ came for us, the reason that he died for us and rose again was that we can live a new life not just have a home in heaven one day which we can but we can live differently we can live a new life so there's a way that we are blessed in Christ we are blessed we can live a new life number seven and in this new life if you go through the rest of chapter six there's some things that stand out we can live with Christ it says we live with Christ now we have presence his presence with us it says in verse 13, we can live as instruments of righteousness. Beautiful sort of image, instruments of righteousness. We can live with purpose. We can offer ourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. We can make a beautiful sound as we live the right way. We can be used for good. We can make a beautiful music. We can bring peace, instruments of righteousness. That's purpose. It says we do not have to live with sin as our master. In verse 14, that's a sense of victory. We can actually live with a sense of victory in our lives. He says we can live with a heart of obedience to the pattern of Christ's teaching. I love this. That's transformation. Verse 17 of chapter 6 says, Thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You've been set free from sin and you've become slaves to righteousness. I love that phrase. You've Come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching of Christ that's, cl that's claimed your allegiance. You know, allegiance is such a big thing. You know that I love that word and I love that sense of faith as allegiance and always Jesus and all of that. And Paul says here, in Christ, we can people, be people who have embraced and have been claimed by the pattern of Jesus' way in our life, in our heart. And we obey from the heart the way of God. And that's our allegiance was with him. And that's transformation. And we can live freely, voluntarily as slaves to righteousness. We can, in our freedom, we can give ourselves as slaves to righteousness, verse 18. So all these things, presence and purpose and victory and transformation and freedom, are all part of the new life we can have in Christ, this new life that we can have. You know, it's interesting to note. I don't know if you notice this, but it says we've been baptized into this new realm, baptized into Christ. Baptism is the 
is a sense of union with Christ. We identify with Christ. We die to our old selves and die, identify with his death. We're buried underwater and we're raised to new life. As symbolically, that's what is, it symbolizes what's happened to us and who we identify with. It's, it's been throughout history, through, in church history, it's been identified as the, real, the way in which people enter this realm of, of Christ. It's been associated with the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Spirit and the entry into the people of God. You know, it struck me as I thought about this um, this week that uh, for all of my life and the, all the years that I've been coming to this church, essentially in, people could get baptised here whenever they wanted to. But now, as of a couple of weeks ago, we're not free to do that. We're not free to have many people here if we did do that. That sort of opportunity to do that with your church family is gone for a while, to do it in with, with everyone. And maybe think that maybe there's some of you even out there watching this who think have been putting that off, who've been thinking about being baptized. And now the opportunity's gone to do that as a celebration together for a while. But wouldn't it be cool that when we got back to church on that first day we're back, wouldn't it be cool if there was somebody, or some more than somebody, who said, you know, I wanna having realized that opportunity's been taken away from me, I want to take it. I want to be baptized into Christ. I want to make my public declaration. i just leave that with you. Perhaps that's you sitting out there watching. If it is, let me know. We'd love to look forward to doing that together on the first day back at church. That would be a very cool thing. Number eight, in Christ we have eternal life. Famous verse at the end of chapter 6. It says, now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves to God and benef the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The realm of Adam leads to death. The realm of Christ leads to life, eternal life. life eternal life here and, and into the future. This is two contrasts that Paul has been pushing through this passage. In chapter 7, Paul addresses the weak specifically. He reinforces something he's already said earlier that would have really been a bombshell to the weak and they would have found hard to swallow. He says that in Christ, they, the Jewish Christians, in Christ, they are dead to the law. The law is dead to them and they are released from it. This law that they have loved and followed and wanted other people to follow, wanted the strong to follow, he says you're dead to it and you're released from it. You don't have to follow it anymore in Christ. This is big for them. And it wasn't that the law was bad, he says. The law helped you realize your need of Christ and your, and your sinfulness. But the thing with the law is that it was powerless to bring about the kind of life that faith in Jesus and life in the Spirit brings. And so you need to die to it and live to, to Jesus. In verse 6 of chapter 7, he says, But now by dying to what once bound us, We've been released from the law so that now we can serve in a new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. I love that phrase. In Christ, we can now serve in a new way of the spirit. That's number nine. We get to serve in a different way. We can serve in humility and faith and love and power, not out of duty and obligation and in our own strength. We can serve in a new way of the spirit. We can participate with God in what he's doing in the world with us through his spirit and what he's doing with us together by his spirit. We can serve in the spirit. You know, it's such a subtle thing, isn't it, whether I'm serving in the spirit or serving in my own strength because on the surface you may not be able to tell. I might say the same things, do the same things, but it's so much more powerful when I serve in the new way of the spirit, independence on God and energised by the spirit and the spirit works through me and through you. Let's be people who serve in the new way of the spirit and be conscious of that. And we can do that. We're blessed. Well, Paul finishes chapter 7 talking about how even though we're in Christ, we still struggle with sin and we still fail at times. No matter how much we struggle, but no matter how much we fail, the truth is that in Christ, we can, Christ has rescued us. And Paul says that at the end of chapter 7. He talks about his own woes or the woes of a um, typical person. And he says at the end of Chapter 7, verse 25. But thanks be to God who delivers us through Christ Jesus. Who, what a wretched man I am, he says, 
Who will rescue me from that body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who rescues us in Christ Jesus. And here's our last point. You know, in Christ, we can live with a real sense of thankfulness in our lives and gratitude to God for rescuing us, for giving us this new life. It's a beautiful thing to live with an underlying thankfulness in our life, no matter what's going on that can't be taken away from us. You know, as we finish up, I've done all ten, so we're about to to finish. The life God wants us to live is a life lived by faith in Jesus and by life in the Spirit. And the truth is, in Christ, we truly are blessed. We really are. We have peace with God. We have hope. We stand in God's grace and unmerited favour towards us. We have the Spirit. We have salvation in all its fullness. We can have a new life that has presence and purpose and victory and transformation and freedom. We have eternal life. We can serve in a new way of the Spirit and we can live with an underlying thankfulness. We really are blessed. You know, lots of things in the last couple of weeks have kind of gone to custard. Just wrecked my holiday plans, my superannuation balance, my connection with my friends. All sorts of things have just gone to custard. Disappeared useless but all these things all these 10 things that we have in Christ we haven't lost anything in fact what's probably happened is they've become more valuable than ever more valuable than my money they've become really valuable perhaps they were always valuable but perhaps we're realizing that they're actually really valuable and that we are really blessed in Christ we haven't lost anything in fact we've probably come to realize how rich we are in Christ May we remember just how blessed we are and may we align ourselves with Jesus and pursue Christiformity in our lives and in our lives together with even greater passion and greater determination than before. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for Romans and what we're learning and what we've been reminded of and just the things that are heightened in our sense, um, in our senses, in our spirit at this time because things that we thought were normal and things we just took for granted have disappeared or have turned to custard, however you want to say it. And we've left, left stripped back to the things that really matter. And we realise that we are blessed people in Christ. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the blessings we have, for the hope and the peace and the grace that we, in which we stand, that the Spirit is with us wherever we go and whatever we do, that we have salvation in all its fullness and that we can live a new life as instruments of righteousness. Help us to do that, I pray. We can live with a heart of obedience because you've claimed our allegiance and Lord, we give our allegiance back to you. Thank you that we have eternal life and the hope that that is. And thank you that we can serve you in a new way in the spirit and we can live with thankfulness. May we align ourselves with you, Jesus, in an even deeper way, I pray. May we be passionate about our faith. May we realise how blessed we are and as people of hope. Amen.